Hi everyone. We're going to cover another topic that's centered on mechanics, but rooted in some of the other things we've been covering thus far. Mechanical properties, plasticity, and the relative implications for performance. Residual stress is often confused with distortion, which occurs after processing of metallic components. They manifest also in other material systems, but their root causes are slightly different. I will cover the distinction between the two in this part of the lecture, while the second part will cover the effects of residual stress on some of the degradation mechanisms we've already covered, such as fatigue and fracture. While all processing will induce residual stresses, there are some that will immediately demonstrate their effects. For example, the additive manufacturing industry still continues to struggle with control of residual stress, such that parts can fail during manufacturing. And even if they don't fail, elevated residual stresses will still remain in the components immediately after processing. Thermal processes such as welding demonstrates the most apparent phenomenon of distortion. Distortion is unintended displacement of select regions of a workpiece driven by the unrestrained expansion and contraction of weld metal that is applied in the base metal to be joined during the heating and cooling imposed by the process. Here are some examples as to how this can manifest for various types of welds. The degree to which distortion occurs is down to the total amount of heat applied, the rate, the material type, amongst many other factors. Welding is therefore an art which aims to minimize distortion and maximize material performance. Sometimes, to alleviate distortion, mechanical constraint is imposed to prevent distortion. In these two examples of distortion, Think about what would happen if mechanical restraint were applied to these parts so they could not distort. Well, there would definitely be some stress that would build up in the restraint system and the workpiece during the process. And stress would remain in the part even if the restraint mechanism were removed. The definition of a residual stress is one that remains in a component when there are no external loads applied to it. Therefore, they are self-equilibrating. If they weren't, then the part would not be stable. They are elastic in nature, even if their magnitude is larger than the yield stress, which can happen in some circumstances. But as you know, plasticity only happens when shear or an unbalanced stress is applied. However, one way of generating residual stress is by the application of plasticity. Placing a bar in three-point bending to the extent that permanent deformation is imposed the top part of the bar will have a compressive residual stress and a balancing tensile stress at the bottom after this event has happened, i.e. after three-point bending. This is because the top part of the bar has been made longer and the bottom shorter, and therefore each side is loaded internally due to the history of each region. A shot peening process can do the same thing. High-velocity particles directed near the surface of a component causes that top surface to elongate, spreading out relative to the subsurface material. This creates a region affected with a high compressive stress very near the surface, which is balanced by a larger tensile region subsurface. As I've previously described with welding, there will always be a residual stress that builds up regardless of the amount of distortion. However, restraint will increase the magnitude developed. The largest stress magnitude occurs along the direction of welding, creating a tensile stress at the welding root, which needs to be balanced by compression elsewhere. Let's now examine why. We can abstract our butt weld last depicted as being a thin plate with two slots cut out in the middle as depicted, and restrain the two bottom corners. Applying heat to the center, the metal will thermally expand. The thermal strain, which is most distinctive and observable by magnitude, will be in the unrestrained directions left and right, and in and out of the plate. This being constrained vertically, a compressive stress will develop in the center, balanced by tensile stress on the outer ligaments. If the stress developed thermally exceeds the yield stress, then the central portion will permanently deform. However, in this example, the outer ligaments will remain elastic. Immediately after heat removal, the stresses decrease and some of the thermal strain will immediately recover, in line with the decrease in stress. However, there is a segment in the center that is still plastic while the stresses are still high, 
and there will be a period of time where there is a stress discrepancy between the central and outer ligaments. The central ligament was made shorter compared to the outer ligaments during this process. The effect realized is that fully cool, the central region is now in tension, but the outer ligaments are in compression. It may be counterintuitive as to why loading in the outer ligaments has changed direction, but plasticity is the key to why this occurs. There is some point during the cooling process where the stresses in the outer ligaments switch relative to the stress in the central region, which creates the residual stress state described. Let's get into why that occurs using a simple physical analogy. Let's replace our ligaments with springs of equal length, coil, and diameter. If there's any load carrying capacity in our central ligament, then during heating the central spring will deform and communicate this to the outer two springs as they are all fixed together. Now, if the yield strength was not exceeded, that is, the material has an infinite strength, then after the load is removed, all of the springs will return to their original positions. But what happens if the yield strength is exceeded in the central spring? That is, it stops behaving linearly with increasing loading. Well, like all physical models involving nonlinearity, we can represent this with a dash pot. A dash pot is a shock absorber. That is, it dampens movement by viscous flow. We now have nonlinearity represented in our physical model. That is, any communication to and from the outer springs has to pass through a dash pot. It still works for material that did not exceed the yield strength or is infinitely strong. The dash pot in these circumstances is empty and therefore there is a rigid link between all springs. The reality is that welding in particular will cause thermal expansion to the point whereby the yield strength is exceeded somewhere in the material. This is why both residual stress and distortion occurs. The degree to which this occurs is down to many, many factors. The parallels from our physical model, i.e. the size of the springs, defining how rigid the material is, the size of the dash pot and its capacity, defining yield, and so on and so forth. The reality is that during cooldown, the outer material, or springs in this case, constrained the central portion which is contracted, gone plastic, and then was acted on by the outer columns. The material in the central portion responded inelastically to end up with a residual tensile stress in the center, and this needed to be balanced by compression in the outer columns. These stresses complicate both the service life of the component, but even follow-on steps. What would happen if one were to machine or otherwise remove some of the component as a follow-on step? Some of those residual stresses would release, causing some potentially unwanted distortion. So the role of plasticity at the macro scale is one that creates a region which would otherwise be longer or shorter dimension-wise that loads up internally. Understanding the relative regions and direction of the stresses imposed is pivotal to remediation and structural assessment. If there's a region that is under compression, then it's balanced by another tensile region, the size and scale of which depends on the range and extent of the source. Such is the case of our analogy, which can represent a butt weld. The weld is constrained by base material, which constrains and confines. This creates a profile appearing as shown in the longitudinal direction of this plate. The degree to which residual stresses develop are down to three discrete mechanisms. The first is that of mismatch. Some region of the material deforms to a greater or lesser extent than the surrounding material for a given far field stress, elastically or plastically driven. There can also be a misfit. These are generated by thermal processes, whereby some region expands or contracts differently than surrounding material. The result is something that is larger or smaller than the surrounding material, in this case, uh, larger. This can be driven purely by thermal effects, as we've seen, or by different properties. For example, inclusions or precipitates will have different thermal expansion and contraction than the surrounding matrix. The third is by transformation. This happens at the very, very small length scale, driven by phase changes. The classic example of this in action is the transformation of austenite to martensite which has different crystal structure. The phase change can create a specific type of misfit, whereby a load of atoms are expected to conform to a much smaller volume. 
specific to the austenite to martensitic transformation, the displacive shear transformation causes a unique type of residual stress. We'll discuss this further in the second part, as knowing the type of stress, the length scale which characterizes each, are important to understand. So, in this part of the lecture, we've covered the link between distortion and residual stress, where residual stress come from, and that they are elastic in nature and self-balancing. Using a three-bar analogy to welding and a further spring and dashpot model, the development of a misfit residual stress has been described. The further main sources of residual stress at a fundamental level spanning many length scales has also been covered. Beyond misfit, there is also mismatch and transformation-induced residual stresses. In the second part, the type, their length scale, and the implication on some of the degradation mechanisms we've discussed to date will be covered. Until next time.